Okay. So welcome back, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Professor Munzer Dale, again from MIT, but from IDSS. He's the director of the Institute for Data Systems and Society, and also a faculty member at LITS. He's going to t tell us about the marketplace for data. Munzer. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Amarali. Um, let me just try to adjust this. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, workshop. It's always nice to come to Princeton to listen to MIT colleagues. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. Um, I do want to give you uh, sort of uh, remarks about uh, how do we think about data as a currency and, and, and think about marketplaces. This work is uh, primarily by Anish Agarwal, who's sitting right there, and raise your hand. Advertisement for Anish, and then he'll also be presenting um, uh, a poster on the subject, and it's also in collaboration with Tohin Sarkar and Devrat Shah. Um, I mean, depending how much you've been thinking about this problem, there's a lot to swallow about how to think about data in a marketplace. My talk is trying to um, hit some compromise between uh, perspective and formulations and some results. Um, I may fail in all respects, and hopefully not. Hopefully I can give you an idea of why we're doing all of this and what are some reasonable formulations and what kind of results can we expect to get from these formulations. I'm going to skip this, and let me just talk a little bit about data. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about data. This is a workshop on optimization. I think optimization is going to come up as a major component of how you design a marketplace. But ultimately, I do want to talk a little bit about data, and I want to say that it has transformed the way we think about the things. Not so much that data is a new thing. It's, data has been the, the core to scientific discovery for centuries back, but that now we have a lot of data. We can measure a lot of things. We can sense things and, you know, behavior and people and economics and, and machines and so forth, that it's actually changing the way people think about their businesses. It's changing the value proposition. Companies are changing their value proposition from building machines into selling data or using the data to do better predict predictions in certain things. And uh, the quote here, for example, from the European uh, Consumer Commission, I say, personal data is the new oil of the internet and the new currency of the digital world. And we're seeing that so much tension is put towards understanding what your personal data is worth. What's your privacy worth? Is it worth anything or not? How do we assess all of this? Um, we work closely with uh, Thomson Reuters, and this is a data company. It, uh, it sells data. And one of the problems they commonly have, and this is the same from Bloomberg and Nielsen, is how do you price your data when you send it to your customers? What is the value of the data that you give to your customers? And if you actually look into their processes and try to understand what they do, it's actually quite interesting. They use fear tactics. They tell you, your competitor has bought this data. And so you go off and buy more and more data. Of course, there is a recognition that your own data alone, the one you're collecting, is not sufficient. That somehow you need to either acquire other data sets or share with other people. But it's not clear why you're doing that. So they use these fear tactics. And as soon as they get you in, they try to get as long of a contract as they can to hold you in because they can't guarantee that next time around you'll come back. And why? Well, because it's not clear that you actually got any value out of the data. And we all know, for example, people who work in dynamic systems and control data can become very stale very quickly. And so the question is, is this data that I bought today even valuable for tomorrow? And how do I assess all of this? In other contexts, when you think about 23andMe, um, it's very interesting. Today, actually, they make you pay money to get your data. You should be charging them, but um, they give you some information, and that's worth 100 bucks, apparently. Uh, but that data is getting sold to pharmaceuticals, getting sold to insurance. We discovered recently that the data can be used to actually catch criminals, which was a great thing. Al although you sign, they tell you in fine print that you know, your explicit data will not be used anywhere against you. But there is a possibility that one day um, your data indicates that you have some sort of um, rare disease. And then the feedback effect of this is that your insurance will actually skyrocket because they have this information about the possibility of you getting sick in the future. So the feedback effect from acquiring your data is very important. And as you think about whether your data was worth anything or not, maybe I paid you some money today because it looked like, OK, your data is good for me to, say, understand how the Uber taxis are going to work. 
right? But then you have to also understand the feedback effect of potentially selling you a product that depends on that data that the product will be jacked up. So there's a lot of issues that are coming with understanding how your data is being valued. And I'm going to touch on some of these issues as we go along. Just continuing, I mean, sort of this crisis of data, you know, when Equifax, for example, was breached and we had over 150 million records that were made public, uh, it was very interesting, you know, we couldn't even put a, a value to this. So what does it mean to, ha to have 150 financial records of individ individual people, Dimitris and Pablo and mine, you know, what is that worth? I don't know what my data is worth. I'm bothered that my data has become public, but I actually have no idea what it's worth. And different than the 2008 financial crisis where you could put a number to the collapse of the stock market, it's not necessarily as accurate, but there is a number of, of the loss that you have, you couldn't put a number to this particular breach. Similar discussion is happening when Facebook gave uh, the data to uh, Cambridge Analytica. I mean, this whole idea, did Cambridge Analytica actually change the outcome of the election? I mean, we actually, the, the jury is not out on that. We know that Cambridge Analytica had the data. We know that Cambridge Analytica targeted people, but we don't know that they actually changed the outcome of the election, right? And if you had to price the value of a decision like this, I think it would be very difficult. Not that I'm, I'm not going to answer all these questions. I mean, it's really difficult to answer. All I'm motivating here is that Data as a currency has a price, and it's impacting certain things that are very important to us, and somehow we need to start thinking about it as that way. And the question is, how do we begin in this particular process? What are the, okay, so, so in principle, you want to be selling data, so what's the problem? Why don't you just sell the data? There's a lot of issues uh, that are different when you think about data or you think about digital goods that are not regular in terms of common goods. So the first one, which is really important, is the idea that you can replicate data at a zero marginal cost. Meaning, I have a data, my, my, my behavior of, say, how I use my car or something of this sort, well, I can sell it to multiple people. I can sell it to competitors. You know, I can, I can sell multiple versions of my data. Very different than, say, uh, selling a pen or selling a computer, because that's something that when you sold, you lose. Okay, this one you can multiply. That's a very important piece of having this digital good, economics around digital goods. The other thing is that there's a combinatorial aspect to this problem, hence the optimization aspect that comes up in these, is that, um, you know, so if, if, uh, and I'll give you some examples, concrete examples of how to think about this, but if a retailer goes out to buy data, the value they get to some prediction task they're interested in may be combinatorial. Combination of different data sets may provide better prediction than other combination of data sets. And so the question is how do they price buying combinations of data sets in order to impact the accuracy of their, of their prediction. Um, also, if you create a market, you're going to have buyers that are, come in, that are going to come in and they have different prediction tasks. These things vary tremendously and so you want to keep track of, okay, so the value of this data to one particular prediction task may be very different from the value the same data set gives to a different prediction task. There's just variation in the way the market values these sort of uh, data. Of course, authenticity is always an issue, but then the real important here is the externality. Okay, and that is another piece of, of this replication. So if I'm a hedge fund, um, I'd like to get data on certain corporations or certain people, but I don't want that data to be given to somebody else. If this data goes to somebody else, then the value to me dec decreases. Okay? But the fact that the seller can give multiple data sets creates a problem in the way I value the data. So the externalities become uh, difficult and an issue there. Uh, the, the analogy, and I don't have time to talk about different types of markets, but there are, we have different types of markets. We've been seeing successful markets. There's a stock market right now, and there are market makers that match supplier and demand, and they price the goods according to some algorithms and so forth, and it's fairly accepted by people to go to the market and buy a stock, and you, and you, you believe that what you paid is what you got in terms of the value of that particular stock. There's another market that is ongoing on the side, which is the ad market, which is now in the 300, 500 billion dollar market, and there ads are being sold on, on websites, right? And so, and many of you probably know 
quite a bit about this stuff. That's some sort of a digital uh, market, except that the good is not replicable. That is, when you, when you are selling a piece of real estate on a website, um, you actually sell it. You lose it. You cannot sell it multiple times. Also, the way that kind of uh, uh, product that you're selling is valued has been simplified to see how often the consumer clicks on it. And so the click stream has become the way it's valued. So the problem has been simplified to try to figure out how to evaluate, how to price this particular market. It's a very interesting market. And it's an online market. Prices are being updated in, in millisecond uh, time frame. And buyers also have, uh, buyers of this real estate have pretty good idea prior on the people that have opened the website. And so there is also information that is being used in figuring out what to, bid in order to understand what to bid on that particular real estate, but also what to portray on that particular real estate. And then there is a, a true, I would say, digital market and prediction markets. Uh, prediction markets, in a way, is, is a way of uh, selling data. But you don't sell a raw data, you sell your prediction. You sell your prediction at a price, and if your prediction is correct, you get paid. So you can think of prediction markets uh, more as uh, crowdsourcing than it is in real market in the sense of exchange, but it is also an, a, a, a kind of a digital market in, in form. Okay, so I, there's quite a bit of activity going in this area. A lot of work is happening in economics and optimization and, uh, and so forth, but actually let me wait on this slide and talk about it until the end when I describe to you what we're doing and then give you a bit of a contrast on that. But there's quite a bit of activity going on. So in a nutshell, you want to design a market, and this is what I said, this is sort of a, a talk about a system. So I'm going to talk about different components of that system, and there's a lot of pieces to it. But essentially what we're thinking about is that what we have is, in a market, we have sellers. There are a bunch of people who have data sets that they would like to sell for a value. And they are buyers that come in to the market to buy data sets in order to um, understand a certain prediction task. I'll give you an example, a concrete example, that will be, for example, a retailer that is interested in predicting demand. So they have a very uh, specific uh, question. You know, I want to know what my demand is at the end of uh, September or October, and I want to buy data to help me figure out this particular demand, right? So my prediction task is very clear. I also, as a buyer, I'm going to make an assumption. I want to say that the buyer knows the value that this accuracy gives them. That is, if they get 10% accuracy in predicting the demand, they know that this translates to X amount of dollars. It's not unreasonable, it might not be very precise, but it's not unreasonable. So that's what I mean by value of the accuracy. So they come into the market having a prediction task and a value of accuracy. Market has to do everything now. The market first has to assign the prices on the data. It has to have a mechanism by which to tell the buyer, you give me a bid. Based on this bid, I'm going to give you a subset of this data set. Okay? And then the market is going to evaluate whether that subset of the data set actually improves the accuracy or not. So here, in this piece that I just said, I'm thinking of prediction machine learning algorithms as a commodity that sits in the market. I'm not going to spend any time talking about how that works. All I'm going to say is market has the ability to take the data and provide a prediction to the prediction task, evaluate the value it gives. Based on that value, the market will then tell the buyer to pay a certain amount of money. Okay? The market takes that money and gives it to the sellers. That's what the market does. Now, in giving it to the sellers, the market also has to be um, careful because not all the sellers deserve the same amount of money. Some data is better than others. So the market has to figure out who gets more or less depending on how much value did they add to the prediction task. So the market sets the mechanism, okay? Market allocates the data to the buyer. The market decides the value of, to the prediction, collects money, gives it to the sellers. That's a market. That's the mechanism that I'm proposing. And what I will do is I'll give you an in-principle set of things that will actually work. Remember now, all of this is a combinatorial thing because given the, the prediction task, the market has all these possible combinations of data that they can give you. And then the market, of course, has to always continue to set the prices of the data. 
This formulation, by the way, doesn't start with any priors in the data. There's no knowledge of, so the sellers are strings of numbers, and the buyers come in with a prediction task. So there's no probability, there's no learning happening yet in this description. So this two-sided market is, is, is fairly common, and actually if you start thinking about of a lot of applications, you will see that this two-sided market actually makes a lot of sense. You know? I'm not gonna go into a lot of the details. We got interested in this by thinking about utilities and buying data from electric utilities, buying data from consumers to figure out how to predict their demands in order to increase the efficiency in the market, right? And so that was one setting which exactly fits this framework. The one example I want to just elaborate on so I can hammer the assumptions of this work is the prediction example that I just meant. Uh, so the idea is how do we come up with, so the retailer that comes to the market is, some, is a retailer that is interested in predicting the demand on the consumer. And as we know, of course, I'm not going to get into supply chain questions, but if you don't have a good prediction on the demand, it typically has a cascade effect where the errors in the demand translate to a large uncertainty in the inventory, and so the cost of not getting the demand right is high. So that's what the, what the, uh, uh, what the buyer is interested in. And as I said, what is the assumption about the value of accuracy? The assumption is the buyer has this kind of understanding that if they make a 10% improvement in their inventory or in their prediction, they save $10,000. That's, that's an understanding that the buyer has. So they'd be willing to pay, say, $1,000 per 1% 1 accuracy. They have that number. That number is, is private to them. They're not going to communicate it to the market, but that number exists. Okay. Now, the idea here is that, as I said, I'm going to treat the machine learning, the, the prediction tasks, all as commodity. So this is a market that's sitting in there. Buyers and sellers will all agree how, how we're going to use the, uh, the algorithms to predict the value of, uh, in this particular case, the, the demand that the, that the buyer has. It may be a drop menu. I don't really care how you do it. We also agree on how we evaluate the error. So is it an RMS value? Is it a, a logistics so probability of, in terms of probabilities and loss probabilities and so forth? We agree on that up front. We also agree on the time scale. So in some sense, if you think about the way the, the ad market works, the ad markets, as, as you make um, uh, bids, and then you want to collect money from the buyer, you right away evaluate the value of that, of that buyer, of, of, uh, you evaluate the price by looking at the click streams. And so you track the value that you sold for. Same, same thing here, the market is going to have a way in which we'll evaluate whether the prediction in actuality has succeeded or not. So either you know, the real data or maybe proxy data and so forth. But that's what I'm, you know, that package is going to be wrapped under the market, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Okay, and the uh, sellers, of course, who has data that would be relevant to the buyer? I mean, there could be all sorts of sources in this case. Who knows what are the important sources? Maybe you want to see how much traffic uh, is going to the mall. So you look at Uber, Lyft, Taxi, and see how, much, how many people are driving to certain locations. Or you want to see uh, people walking in the mall carrying bags, indicating uh, uh, buying power of customers. Or maybe even looking at financial data, you know. The, Twitter data. There's, there could be a lot of data that could be indicative of this, you know, sort of give value to this, prediction, this particular prediction task. And a priori, we don't know which one is going to be most valuable. But all of these guys are there and they're selling their data. Okay? I made some assumptions here before I give you that, that really important assumptions to simplify the problem, okay? The one assumption I'm making right now is that the sellers are fixed, okay? So there are M sellers in the market, they wanna sell data, and they're not changing. So these data sets exist, okay? The second thing is I'm gonna assume that the buyers are gonna come one at a time, okay? With that assumption, I remove the question of externality. Right? So I, I sort of simplified the problem, so I'm not too worried about selling data to multiple buyers. A buyer comes, they buy a data set, leaves the system, a new buyer comes in. The new buyer that comes in has nothing to do with the previous buyer. Okay? So that's my, my formulation. I'm going to tell you something that occurs. And of course, these are assumptions, they're not necessarily 
uh, they shouldn't stand. We should figure out how to do that when changing these assumptions, but this is the current assumption. Okay. So the, the, the setup, a little bit of uh, equations here, is that I have m data sets. They're fixed. I don't know, denote those by x sub j. You could be an individual in the market selling your data, but right now you're fixed with a fixed data set. Yeah, yeah, they add to it. But, but you know, in principle, you and I can also be selling our data in the market. Right? In principle, it can be the same. Right? All right, so XJ is the data. Why? Uh, okay, so that's the, the seller. So think of the seller as a bunch of uh, data sets. Each one is a feature set of link T static, okay? And then I have a buyer, the buyer comes in every time incident, there's a new buyer that comes in and they come in with two things. One is YN is the prediction task that they're interested in. So think of YN as another sequence of number they would like to predict. Example was the demand, that was one example, um, the, de the consumer demand. They also come in with their knowledge of the accuracy. Remember, I, I made a big deal out of this. They know the value of the accuracy to them. I, I denote that by mu sub n. So you come in with your prediction task. You know your private valuation of how much the accuracy in the prediction translates to dollars. You come in with that. Okay? And... Uh, you're going to come in with a bid, but I haven't told you yet how you're going to bid in the system. But you're going to come in also with a bid. You're going to bid on data, and we'll describe that bid. Now, in principle, already the problem looks very combinatorial because you're going to have M price, M uh, uh, data sets to buy from, and each is going to have a price. And so there are different choices for how you design bids. You could bid at each individual product, or you can bid at all of them. You can bid at the sum. So different ways you can actually design a bid, and I'm going to give you a prin an in principle a way to do that. So the BN is a bid that's it's going to come in in a second. Okay, so let's just define some variables here to make sure that we can track all of this. So I'm repeating myself, but I do want to get the formalism right. Okay, so the first thing the marketplace, the first thing first thing that the marketplace does is sets the prices for the product. Okay, so there's a vector P sub N that assigns a price to each product. This price is going to be updated in every iteration. Okay, that's the, the online, ultimately it's going to be the online optimization problem that we need to solve. So this price needs to be updated. each. So first, the market sets the price. Second thing is the market sets a mechanism for which you can bid and then you get allocated product. Okay, it's going to come in a second, but that mechanism Okay, is going to ask you to, of course, you're going to come in with a Y. Remember, as a buyer, you're going to come in with a Y. That's your prediction task. And then the market is going to ask you for a bid, BN. Based on that bid, it's going to allocate a subset of the products to you. Okay? Based on the subset of products and the embedded machine learning prediction algorithms that we have, we are going to, the market is going to tell you, here is how much accuracy you're going to gain out of the system. Based on that accuracy, it collects a certain amount of money from you. The collection of money is, is PF. This is the payment function. It's very important to understand what that payment function is. The payment function is not necessarily the bid. Okay? Like in second price auctions, for example, payment function is not the bid. And here, too, the payment function can be different from the bid. Once you have the payment function, you collect that amount. Now you want to give it to the sellers. As I said, you have to allocate it depending on their contribution. So I need a, a way to divide this revenue among the buyers. So I need another function you know, that will help me do that. Those are the things that need to be defined in order to get this to work. Now, what are the issues in all of this? Okay, well, I'm going to start bottom to the left. I would say the first thing, of course, the market needs a mechanism by which it continues to update prices. Okay? So we want to maximize revenue. So at every step, the market needs to pick the next price to maximize the revenue in the system. But, of course, it's an online learning because the bids and the prediction tasks 
are not revealed until you, you price. So, so first you price, and then the bits come in, and then you price, and then the bits come in, and so you have an online type learning. So how do we do that problem? And it looks pretty complicated. Well, we'll see how complicated it is. Okay? The second thing is, you know, how to allocate the data and how to define the, price, the payment function. That's very important. Third one, as, as uh, firms are coming to bid on the data, how can we guarantee that they bid truthfully? That they don't, don't try to game the system in such a way where they bid low in order to come up with a better outcome. So truthful bidding is very important. Second price auction is an example of a truthful bidding. You're incentivized to bid the valuation of, of the product you're buying. And finally, how do you divide? Okay? So, okay, so let's start with these things, and I know that there's a lot of stuff to talk about with a small amount of time. But the, the value, okay, so the first thing is the truthfulness. Truthfulness comes from the fact, okay, so how is the, the so I'll describe the details of this, but how is the buyer going to um, bid? They're going to bid based on maximizing their utility. So they're going to say, if I pay a certain amount and I get back this much, I want to maximize the difference between the two. So that depends on the allocation function, it depends on the payment function, so we have to decide what these things are. So let me give you, an, in principle, a proposal for what these things can be, okay? So the first thing, I'm gonna have a very simple allocation function. I have a price vector already set in iteration N. I have the price for all the products that I have. You bid N, bid a value B sub N, okay? And I'm gonna say, if your bid is higher than the price, you get, you get that product. So you bid a number. You're not gonna bid a vector, one number. And I'm going to compare that number to every price. And if you're higher than the price, you get the product. If you're lower than the price, you don't get the product. Very simple allocation mechanism. Okay? Here's the proposed payment function. So we're going to say that the payment is the uh, Meyerson's payment rule. How does it work? It basically says that you pay the marginal utility of each allocation. You don't pay for all the value that you got, but the marginal utility, that is the extra. If you bid a, a small amount extra, you got allocated an additional feature, you pay the difference, okay? So in pictures, it looks like this. Your bid is sitting over here, these are the prices, so if the bid is higher than a certain price, you're gonna allocate that product, but then what you're gonna pay is the difference between what you just got allocated, the, the, the accuracy you, receive from getting that particular product minus all the products from before. That's the marginal, that, that's the marginal utility. And that's the Meyerson's rule. And it's, it's a pretty complicated function, uh, but has a lot of nice features. And these nice features have been recognized in the economic literature. So this is a, a function that exists, okay? It's not, we didn't dream up of it from uh, thin air. Now here's the first result that actually is quite straightforward to prove, and that is if you do a maximum utility based on this payment function, okay, so you're gonna bid, based on the bid you get allocated set of products, based on the allocated set of products and the, and the machine learning algorithm and the accuracy function, you have a payment function, put that all together, maximize your utility, and it turns out that you actually, your bid will match your, your truthful information. Bn will equal as mu n, and you will bid truthfully. Okay? And sort of similar to the sort of notion of equilibria that emerges from a second price auction. Okay? So by taking this function and this simple bidding algorithm, now we have a way in which we can at least guarantee that there's a faithful, um, faithful uh, bidding coming from the users. Now the question is, Okay, and we have a payment function, I just proposed it. So I proposed everything, I'm done now. I've given you a payment function, I've given you the allocation, I have everything that the market needs to do. What's missing right now is the update rule for the price. Okay, but before I go there, I wanna see, so now that you got the payment, can you actually divide it out between the sellers? That's another problem of its own. How do you divide it out between the sellers? It turns out that that's not a trivial exercise. So the first notion that you get is some sort of a shapely allocation, right? So what you're doing is you're playing a coalition game. You're trying to figure out, here's what you're trying to figure out. If I assigned, so here's in, in the simplest possible way to think about this. If I assign this buyer a subset of the data because of their bid, 
I want to see for each one of those, what's the incremental value it has over the rest of the product. So I want to look at every possible combination of products. I throw in that one product and I take it out. And I see that marginal difference. Okay, so I have to do this 2 to the M, whatever number of 2 to the K, say where the K is the number of products that have been allocated to that particular consumer, to the particular buyer, and I want to compare for every combination what happens if I add the product and what happens if I take out the product and I get the sort of the uh, shapely allocation. That looks like it's an exponential type thing, but it satisfied nice properties. It sort of, um, well, it gives us a division, a partition of the data, a partition of the money to be given to the buyers. So it gives us that partition, and it's complete. It add, adds up to one, so all the money will be allocated. Okay? The second thing it does is that if two sources provide the same value in the prediction task, they get the same amount of money. That's reasonable. And if your data did not contribute to the prediction task, you get zero, and that's reasonable. And that all happens from this um, uh, allocation, from this shapely allocation, uh, from this uh, shapely allocation function. The problem with it is its complexity, okay? Because you have to try all of these different combinations. Now, you know, I'll quickly tell you that there's a, a there's a nice result that turns out that comes from this, which is the fact that when you think about the shapely allocation, the expression, it actually is written in terms of the expectation over a set of permutations of these products. Okay, and you can actually verify that easily, that that's the expression. It's, a set, it's an expectation over a set of permutation. So then, we're in, you know, using sort of uh, kind of a sampling technique, what you can do, you can actually just sample um, uh, over the set of permutations, and then instead of actually solving the combinatorial problem, you solve a linear problem, and you get the division with high probability. So there's a bunch of results that we've been uh, sort of working on that will allow us to... Uh, do the computation here in linear time. It's very important to do this in linear time because, as I said, uh, the time scale for these problems could be extremely high, could be extremely fast, and so you need to be able to do this computation really fast, okay? Um, now, here's an interesting issue before I leave this. We have, here is one place where the, um, the fact that you can multiply the data sets can become a problem, okay? So suppose, for example, that I have two sets of the two companies, one is selling A and the other is selling B, okay? And A and B had the same contribution to the prediction task. So then my method will actually allocate half the revenue to the first one and half the revenue to the second one. But then one of these guys will think, wait a minute, okay? So if I actually, I know that I'm good, I don't have to be good actually, why don't I just come in under a disguise of another company with the same data. Now I have A, A, and B. They all contribute the same way to the prediction task, but now A gets one third, one third, one third. They get one third, one third, one third. So A and A prime get two thirds, and the other guy gets one third. And so forth. And now the, the, the sellers will start playing the market. So somehow you have to prevent, because they can multiply, because they can sell the data, they multiply the data, it doesn't cost them anything, they can sell it, put it in the market, so that means that they can actually get more money. So then we had to come up with a mechanism in which we can uh, disincentivize people from multiplying their data, and that's through um, a, sort of a, a, at least a proposed solution is to weigh the, the partition number. So remember, the shapely allocation partitioned the, the value, the, the revenue, into, into different uh, ratios. But now for each one of those, you discounted by the distance your data set to every other data set in the, in the group. Okay, so you take a function, like a cosine function or a distance function, SM of X, M, and XJ, it measures how far you are from other data, and then it discounts the allocation by those distances. So here's what happens if you do something like this. It's something, it's not exactly the cleanest solution, but what happens is, um, well, if you're different than every data set, say you're orthogonal to every data set, then you get back the same allocation that you got before. If you're close to data sets, you have to share some of that stuff. In other words, you get discounted. Both of you get discounted. And so in one hand, it solves the problem of replication. Okay, and I'll show you the example. 
So the example would be if we started with the example A and B, and now with the weighting function, with the discount function that I added, um, they get equal amounts, okay? But if A multiplied itself, now you have to discount by the distance between all the data sets. In fact, it turns out that this guy gets much less than what they would have had if they stayed the same, if they didn't multiply. So when they multiply, the total revenue they generate is less than the data they had before. So quick aggravation. So is there an intrinsic notional similarity? Or is this similarity based on its usefulness? So that's a really good question, right? I mean, we've been actually, so I'll, I'll come back to that point. I mean, the point is that is there a, yeah, is there a natural notion, and what are the trade-offs that come with the similarity question? Can the natural notion be it's used for the, for the bias? Used for the bias, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so that one, one caveat of this, of course, is that if you, if you were two independent uh, sellers and you were close to each other, you also got discounted. So it's not just the replication that got um, penalized, also peop the sellers that are similar to each other got penalized. So, you know, that's a, that's a negative aspect of this discount. You can think of it as, well, okay, well, I mean, in markets, if you're really coming in with similar data sets, maybe your contribution should be discounted. But the question there remains of how you do this in the best possible way. And um, I don't want to spend too much time here because I'm running out of time, but then there is a trade-off. One thing that was lost in this discount thing is the balance. What does that mean? It, we are not allocating all the amounts of money anymore. By discounting, some money is left out, and the question is, can we actually minimize how much we don't allocate versus how we resolve the, this tension of uh, similar data sets being, um, allowing the, the buyers, uh, the sellers to, to gain the system. So it's an open question there, and you know, some interesting questions there to be answered. Let me just get to the last part of the talk and say the revenue maximize. So the, just kind of to recap, I gave you, in principle, a proposal for everything that will allow this market to work. I gave you a proposal for how you define the, the bidding mechanism. I gave you a proposal for the payment function. I showed you that for that, the buyers are incentivized to bid truthfully. I also gave you a way in which the payment function can be taken and divided by the, by the sellers, dealt with some issues of replications and some interesting open questions there. Now the last thing the market has to do, once that buyer, pa buyer passes, it has to update the price vector. It has to update the price vector based on the information that, based, based on the, uh, all the past information that it had. Remember, in this formulation, I didn't put any prior on the data sets, I didn't put any priors on the prediction tasks, I didn't have any priors on the bidding or the private information. So all of this are strings of numbers and you're trying to match strings of numbers. So the best sense in which you can actually optimize um, the behavior of the market is to do something along the lines of no regret. That is, if you, if you had an optimal price vector, P star, that, that optimized the revenue, so we calculate the revenue, that's the amount of money we collected, P star optimizes the revenue over all possible bids and all possible prediction tasks, if there is such a P, P star, then what we want to do in our online learning is approximate that solution, you know, fast enough. So, you know, no regret converging, say, one over square root of n, typical type of result that you would get in no regret. That's what you want. So you want an update law that allows you to get to this optimal price vector. As I said before, you know, you're, you're updating the price before you see the bids, so in principle you're doing a worst case type update. Okay, and that's where the optimize, that's the online optimization, hence the connection to this workshop. So, it turns out that this is a non-trivial exercise. Part of the reason is that if you look at the payment function, it's a, it's a non-linear function, right? The allocation is a complicated function of the bid. So you got this whole uh, complicated uh, stuff that is hidden under the evaluation of accuracy function. At the end, you allocate, you compute the prediction, you evaluate the accuracy, and then you have this complicated payment function. And you're trying to do all of this in a, in a, in a computational way. Now, one interesting, I'm gonna make two observations. This is uh, uh, research that is ongoing right now, but, uh, but two observations that I wanna make, okay? Okay, so let me do that. The first observation is actually the Myerson function has a lot of nice structure, okay? 
And if you assume uh, submodularity of the gain function, so what does that mean? That's if you, if you actually evaluate the uh, accuracy of prediction, the function that evaluates the accuracy of prediction, that's a, that's a complicated function of the underlying algorithm that you do. But say it was, for example, as simple as least squares, then you can actually make an argument that that function itself is submodular. Then the payment function looks like a nice extension of that submodular function. It's called the Lovash extension um, in certain regimes. Okay, Lovash extension is essentially a, a sum of differences of these um, uh, submodular functions. So there is a nice structure in certain regimes. The regime is when the bits and the prices satisfy, when the bits are all higher than the pr prices, okay? When the bits are not higher than the prices, then you have to do something else. This is where the work is going. But this nice relationship between submodularity and Lovage extension actually gives us the first set of algorithms for which one can actually begin to update in a, in a reasonable time. Because Lovage extension is convex, then one can use convex online techniques to actually solve these problems. So this is, um, as I said, kind of observation, but it, it does indicate uh, a set of results. The other approach that we're taking um, is actually somewhat different, and that is to convexify the problem through introducing noise to the data. So what you do, instead of actually sending this one data set, you add a continuous level of noise, okay? And the continuous level of noise allows you to sell a data set to every buyer at an appropriate level of corruption. So if you put in a bid, you always buy something, but it may be more corrupted than than the pure data that you have. If you put very small amount of money, you get a very highly corrupted data set. Turns out that that actually convexifies the space, and so one can actually do interesting computation. And from a design perspective, maybe that is even a better way to think about it, because then you come to the market, you buy all the data sets at a different level of accuracy. Your money gives you a certain level of accuracy. And, um, and then this update law can become actually somewhat uh, uh, part of the convex optimization. So this is actually active uh, work that we're doing, but it's exciting and it sort of brings together these types of economic metrics with uh, online optimization. So let me just quickly uh, finish, and before I do that, let me just go back and say there's quite a bit of work that is ongoing right now. Of course, there's data markets and, and, and stories in, in uh, random journals talking about the importance of data, but but in terms of formalism in which you can actually talk about what a market looks like, uh, there's more work that is happening right now. I think a lot of the work that we've seen so far puts some more information at the seller's data set. So either the seller is invested in the prediction task, which is not in our formulation. We don't think of the seller cares about what the prediction task is. Or the seller is heavily invested in their own privacy versus selling. So there's a, a question of how much are they willing to give versus how much they're getting back in their work and so forth. And so there's quite a bit of work in this area and I'm sure that uh, Anish and his poster will be happy to describe these different types of work and how they relate to us. So in conclusion, I wanna say that we did a formalism of a two-sided market. It just gave you an in principle, um, uh, a way to do this. Uh, it has a lot of complexity, many interesting sort of questions to answer, uh, but we would like to get an algorithmic solution. That is, we do think that this is going to be kind of like the ad market, a millisecond market, the trade is gonna be really fast. Your ability to do this computation really, really fast is essential. So all these problems of how you solve these complicated combinatorial problems have to be resolved a priori before a market of this sort is, is defined. All the assumptions that I make at the beginning need to be uh, resolved somehow, so you know, buyers don't come to the market one at a time, and there's externalities in, in their value function, so the, the data that is sold to one affects how much the other person values that same data set. Um, also, the sellers are not stale, the sellers are streaming and coming into the system, and at any given time, you probably don't have access to all the sellers, we have a, access to a subset of the sellers, so again, that has to be uh, somehow uh, relaxed. Um, and then, of course, just one last comment about this value of prediction or value of accuracy. Um, how does a company track that value of accuracy? Now that this is embedded back to sort of maybe some of the comments that Dimitri's made, you know, it's not just a prediction because there's also action, there's intervention. So how do you actually keep track of this, uh, of this level of accuracy is another thing that companies would probably would want to think about and that, that requires modeling and so forth. So I'll stop here, thanks.
question to the rocket okay, one last time for Sanchi. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the goal was to price the data, and then at the end of the day, the engine for pricing is online context optimization. Does this mean that it only applies to machine learning settings where the loss is context or something? Submodularity. I mean, that's when what we, well, I, it, Yes and no, right? So the, the first part of the observation I made is that the, you know, the, the, the VAJ extension, that, that requires submodularity, otherwise you have an unconvex problem. Um, you know, so there's a lot of other parameters to play with, right? I mean, we just gave an, one particular incident of how you can do the bidding. You can actually complicate the bidding a little bit more to convexify the out outcome of the problem. But in principle, at the end of the day, if it's online optimization, we need a convex problem to work with at the end. So how do we convexify? Is it through limitation of the machine learning algorithm or changing the bidding mechanism or changing the payment function? All of these are parameters. I, I guess I'm questioning whether thinking of it as a convex problem is the right thing. What's your thought? I mean, certainly that's where the tools are. Yeah, I mean, uh, oh, I don't know, I don't have a thought whether it's convex or not. All I would say is that you have to be able to compute in real time. However, you can do that. If it's not, if it's not convex, it's got to be something else that allows me to do in real time computation. Whether or not optimality is critical, we haven't analyzed any of this stuff, right? So I don't know, for example, is, is a true optimality important or some kind of a monotonicity uh, in the right directions is also the important thing. I mean, there's, there's a lot to be understood about what the meaning of all of this in a, in a real application, which we haven't done. So I can't really faithfully answer that question, yeah. Up there, please. My allocation, the allocation mapping is a function of the bid and the price and the data. It doesn't depend on the value of the data. Question up. Give me the numbers again. What That's possible. You know, it's possible. I think this argument was made also in, it's interesting, right? Because there's so much attention to the value of data and the, and the fact that your data is sold for ad companies and so forth. And yet, always the argument, oh, how much are you going to get? Two bucks, three bucks for this? Is this worth it for you? And actually, there were some interesting numbers made uh, for selling your, your data to utility companies. Because it's the same kind of a thing. I mean, how much electricity is costing you every, every month? And, and what actually in, is interesting is that when the grid is about to break, that amount is amazingly high. The value of your data multiplies by 100x, okay, because of the disutility that comes with that market. As you look at the price market of electricity shooting, you know, easily, uh, uh, you know, 500x within five minutes. So the argument that my data is worth a small amount and so forth, it depends on where, who, who's using my data. Is it medical data or is it what I bought yesterday in terms of genes, right? And I'm saying that, well, everybody is arguing my data is not worth anything, yet everybody is dying to collect my data. And so I'm not, I think we need to run some experiments. Oh, I see. I see. So you want to put a, a, an incentive? Uh, yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you were saying it, it's a. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. It should be potentially the the seller should have more than just I'll take whatever, because they price their privacy a little bit more. And that, I think some of the work that that uh, that does the privacy puts in a penalty on on that. So that that makes a lot of sense. Sorry. There were other hands, but unfortunately, I have to stop it here because we have only eight minutes until the next talk. So let's thank Moonzer one. Okay, thank you.